as well as giving my top three TV shows, which should be a lot of fun. But we're going to see if I can hear Harry now. He's backstage. Hello. And I can hear you, Harry. Harry, it's okay. great to have you on here on this Monday morning once again for the Farm Report, of course, sponsored by Wolf Enterprises. Uh, what's been going on with you since the last time that we've talked last Monday? Well, it's been uh, an interesting uh, time. Uh, we had the uh, Federal Minister of Agriculture, uh, Claude Bebo, uh, tour the Interlake uh, because of the drought as far as the cattle are concerned. So that was an announcement. It was a bit of a, you know, uh, the announcement, uh, you know, the, the activity around the tour and around the announcement was, I think, more exciting than what actually came out of the announcement. But, but I, I'm not here to totally poo-poo it. Uh, the cattle industry says that it's a first start. We're going to see some things happen that are going to make sure that, that we'll do some things that will keep some of the cattle on farms and not send them all to the marketplace. So the drought continues to be the key thing. But let me talk about one other thing before we get back to that. Uh, just saw a report out of China. You know, China, uh, they basically call the shots uh, when things happen in their country. Uh, sure, they have some media that are able to report objectively, but uh, I just saw on a WhatsApp group, uh, I'm on a WhatsApp group with about 267 hog producers. Most of them are, are from colonies across Western Canada, some into the United States. And the news came out that uh, China was going to really cut back on their soybean purchases from the United States and Brazil and other places, which then indicated that maybe they were growing more soybeans within their country. You, we never know for sure. When, when China, you know, they're so big in the marketplace when it comes to hogs, when it comes to grain, comes to corn, it comes to soybeans, that uh, they, they make announcements and and sometimes those announcements drive down the price, and all of a sudden you you see them back in the market, uh, you know. And and it's had to, so everybody knows this, but you but it's always kind of a uh, you know a, a shot in the dark as to what is actually happening in hog production because they have the uh, they they've got uh, half the hogs in the world are are processed and and eaten in China. One point four billion people. It's their 80% of all their protein that they consume in China is pork. And so they like to play with those markets, the pork and the grain and the corn and so forth, even weather, you know. Uh, and so, uh, and again, I'm not poo-pooing it. I'm not putting them down. I'm just making an observation that <clears throat> I've watched already for some time. So, you know what, and all of that plays into uh, what's going on with the uh, agricultural industry in the rest of the world basically you know and uh, and especially here in north america i mean uh, we in canada we export uh, anywhere from 70 to 80 percent of the grains and special crops we produce uh, the united states they consume more than that at home but they also produce so much more so they export and then we have brazil and then we have the european economic community and so all of this plays into what happens to world uh, grain prices what happens to food prices? What happens to different kinds of things? So that's, uh, I just wanted to share that because I just saw that story just before we came on on the air. The other thing, uh, uh, Graham, I just had a great interview with uh, David Wheats. David is a dairy producer from Grunthal, Manitoba, which is near Steinbeck in, in southeastern Manitoba. Dairy, uh, David is also the uh, chair uh, president of the Manitoba Dairy Farmers, and he's a vice president for the Canadian Dairy Farmers. So David has his hand on the pulse, but he's a great dairy producer. I've toured his facility many times. And uh, 240 cows that they milk every day. And they just installed new robotic milkers. And, and these robotic milkers from the last ones that they installed in 2008 are just plain awesome. I mean, I've toured the barn and, and, and they basically don't have any people within the barn. It's all done by a herdsman sitting and watching his computer. He can see the milk. He can see the feed that they take in. He can, he can see on computer if they've got any disease as far as the udders are concerned and all of that kind of stuff. 
So it's, it's really exciting. Uh, but why I talk to him is that dairy uh, producers, uh, you know, they, they have a good uh, supply management program going, and, and yet uh, they also depend on feed. <laughs> and, and probably more so because their milk quality needs to stay up there. Their milk quantity needs to stay up there. There's processors, you know, it's kind of uh, just in time. You know, they, they produce enough milk that feeds the, you know, the, the market. And so, yeah, on his farm, he said, you know what? Uh, he's a grain and a dairy farmer, so he's a bit better shape than many. But he had toured with the agriculture minister a dairy farm in the interlake. And, uh, and he said it was absolutely sad to see the crop. Uh, David had taken off two cuts of hay from his alfalfa fields. That dairy farmer hadn't taken off one cut. And he says it was just you crunched on the dry uh, plants. And they were, there was just nothing there. So uh, some of these dairy farmers have feed from other from other uh, years, from last year, a bit of uh, stock, but it's going to be a challenge all the way around. And uh, the cattle producers, first and foremost, are the ones that are selling off cattle. Uh, the grain producers, uh, you know, uh, are also in a lot of places, uh, very little crop that will come off. And then, of course, there are pockets where there's some good crops. So uh, all in all, it's, uh, it's a, a really difficult situation, especially when we look at the forecast. Uh, there really isn't any rain in the forecast in the immediate foreseeable future. So those are the kinds of things that continue to happen. And harvest, we've got uh, harvest. I have a friend, uh, Russ Peters, uh, farms with his dad just north of Winkler here. He texted me last night. He says, you know what? The combine in wheat is going to roll in about a week's time, but I asked him how much is the how much does he think it's going to yield? Well, he says we really don't know. It doesn't look good. Maybe half of what we had in the past. So there you go, uh, a, a bit of a ramble, but not a rant, just a ramble. <laughs> yeah, for sure, and uh, great insights for sure of just what what's happening in agriculture right now. Uh, well, we'll get into more of that next week as uh, I feel like these stories will continue to develop, right? But uh, one thing that I'm interested about is going back to the uh, that that milk thing about the uh, you know just sitting back for these farmers and just getting to see all the cool things that that technology brings. Just how revolutionary is that concept of what's been putting out there? Just the milk. <laughs> It's so revolutionary, and and I go back, you know, quite a few years. I milked cows by hand, and we had one Jersey cow on our farm, and I milked morning and evening, squeezing those those teats on the udder, like you know, and, and getting a half a pail of milk and so forth. These guys, David and his uh, his brother, uh, they have two hundred and forty cows, and and this I've watched it, and and, and this uh, it, it's so revolutionary. He says, uh, right now, the, the new robotic milkers they put in, they got four of them. And they're not cheap. They cost a lot of money. But uh, they can basically, they can sense, uh, they, they not only, uh, they, they, they wash the, the, it's all encompassing. Their barn, the, the cows are milked automatically by robots. Uh, the, the milk is, for course, taken out to the cooler through pipes. Uh, they, they, the feeding is all automatic and the manure cleaning out the barn, the cow manure is yeah. also automatic. So, 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 so yeah. they, when they put in their first robotic milkers, they were able to uh, drop their uh, employee, uh, employee numbers down and their production went up 10%. Wow. So that's, that, you know, that's key. And he says, now he says, it will continue to go in that direction. He didn't want to tell me just exactly how much his production was going to increase, but he says we're going in that direction. And uh, and so, uh, yeah, it, when I walked into the first robotic milker, my wife was still alive. We were in a dairy farm in uh, Duluth, Minnesota, near Duluth. And we went into one dairy farm that had the original milking uh, parlor. And then we went into a robotic controlled milking parlor and we walk into this barn and it's like where are the cows where are the cows because you couldn't hear 
one moo. You know, these cows are so content because they're not being uh, interspersed and, and disturbed by human beings. They are left in that barn all to themselves and can totally relax. And uh, and they go through that, uh, you know, they go through a feeder, automatic feeder. When they get hungry, they go through that. And, and if they've, uh, and then from there, they go into the milker. So if they're trying to sneak into the feed or to the milker a little sooner, then they get turned back. The, the gate opens up and they got to go back again and, and eat a little bit more. I mean, that's simplistic, but that's exactly what happens. So, and the guy sits there in his, um, in his office. He's called the, 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 the herdsman. Yeah. Or the woman, right? He sits in the office, watches on computer, and he can see exactly what's going on, how much milk that particular cow to the decimal point. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's insane. That that is revolutionary. Like you said, uh, you know, like uh, like you said, it's it's not disturbing the cows as much, which is a great upside to to you know the the milkers and the feeders automatically stuff like that. Uh, just before I let you go, of course, a uh, tradition on this show. Seaman says, Harry Seaman's farming tip of the week for farmers here in Manitoba. What is it this week, Harry? Number one, it's uh, people are getting ready for harvest. So my, my tip, not only to farmers, uh, but also to us people that are driving on the roads. There's a lot, the, the equipment is so big. The combines, the uh, grain carts, the trucks, they're so big. So I'm just saying, watch the triangular signs. If you see a slow moving vehicle, take that into your mind. That's a slow moving vehicle. It's about 10 times as big as it was, you know, 15, 20 years ago. And the roads haven't become wider. So you need to be careful to everybody. That's my number one tip. The second tip is uh, to the cattle industry, the grain industry, the dairy, the entire agricultural sector. You know what? Guys and gals work together. And I know most of them do. But even now, so it's even more important to work together. And I'm going to end with my motto, which I like in my Motto is a positive mental attitude to encourage and to serve others will motivate me to do my best. Encourage each other. That's my last word. Awesome. Wise words, as always, from Harry Siemens on, as Siemens says, the farming tip of the week. Of course, uh, the Farm Report will be back next week. We'll uh, be talking to Harry again of just the updates of what's going on in agriculture here in Manitoba and uh, the, the stories that have been uh you know, pretty consistent throughout the, the past month here. Uh, thanks so much for joining me once again. As always on Monday, Harry, always a pleasure. Thank you. Take care. Going to commercial break. We'll be back with the next guest, the final guest on this edition of Rise and Shine Manitoba, Bill Johnson, Executive Director of Football Manitoba here on Rise and Shine Manitoba on ASTV Productions. <laughs>